Let's keep working on this idea of osmosis by focusing on the terminology that we often run into. And what I mean by that is in the world of medicine and physiology, we're often only given one side. And so, like, for example, in this image, we're expected to understand that these terms up here, that is the hypertonic, the isotonic, and the hypotonic, are always referring to the extracellular fluid. And they did not tell us about the intracellular fluid or the cytoplasmic fluid. We're not told about that. So earlier we did that. We said, all right, well, here's our fluids and we defined this side as being hypotonic relative to this other side. Or you could say that this side is hypertonic relative to that. So, right, so we can define both sides. Well, instead of telling us both, they only tell us one. So it's as if they only tell us the hypotonic side or the hypertonic side, and we're expected then to realize what's going on. So let's try that. Let's see how that might work. So here are these red blood cells or erythrocytes, and they've been exposed to a hypertonic solution. And what that means is that the cell's contents are hypotonic by comparison. So let's back up for a second. Recall, here's our hypotonic side, and here's our hypertonic side. So if we say this is our cell, and here's the fluid that they're exposed to, we would say that their water is going to be sucked out of the cells and go to this hypertonic side. Now, that's not a very good arrow, but I think you get the gist of what I'm doing here. And that's what they show. They show that the fluid from the red blood cells is being drawn out, and we get this what's referred to as a crenation effect, but kind of that raisin-looking effect. Over here, let me get to this other side, hypotonic. So the environment that the cells are in, or the extracellular fluid that the cells are finding themselves in, is hypotonic, which by default then says that their contents would be hypertonic. Same thing, let me go back, right? So outside the cells, we're going to find this fluid, the hypotonic fluid. Inside the cells, by comparison, is hypertonic. And so once again, the majority of fluid movement is going to be into, in this case, into the cell. So let me go back, All right, and that's what they show down at the bottom. Fluid's going to move into the cell and swell it up. And this could be potentially dangerous, and we'll talk about that more in lecture. Isotonic, on the other hand, iso is referring to the same concentration. So here's what we do with this idea. When we talk about isotonic solutions in the world of physiology or medicine, we're ex expected to know then that that's the same as normal body fluids. So for example, if we if we had a person walk into a clinic and need some sort of hydration because they were dehydrated, we might offer them a Ringer's lactate IV. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but all that we're saying is we're giving them a fluid that is isotonic compared to normal body fluids, compared to normal body fluids. That's the key here. And so their body cells are going to draw in water until they come to what's said to be normal, and then their cells will have these normal shapes. And then they'll op operate properly, right? They won't be raisin-like, and they won't be all swollen like this, so they'll have the correct shape, and they'll operate properly. So isotonic is something we want to pay attention to, and so that's what we like. Our cells like to have an isotonic solution or an isotonic background to live in, so they can move fluids in and out at will. I have this question, please pause it and kind of explore it. I'm going to spend time in lecture talking about the math related to this, um, not in the videos here. So please, right, if you're curious about how to solve this, we'll do it in the lecture hall. Active transport. All right, so up until this point, we've been talking about fluid movements or material movements in and out of the cells that have been free, that is all the different kinds of diffusion, so let me go back, just osmosis, which is facilitated diffusion, or just basic diffusion, right, these are free. So when we get to this idea of active transport, this is a costly process. And so what we're doing here is we're moving things against the concentration gradient. So against the concentration gradient, right, means we're moving things from areas of lower concentration to areas of higher concentration. So the reverse of what we saw before, or you could say we're trying to move things upstream. And 
I mentioned earlier that this costs energy, and this is one of the most costly things that we do as far as our energy use is concerned. So we use a lot of ATP or adenosine triphosphate to do this. And one of the ways you would recognize that there's energy involved is if we talk about these molecules right here, this, this protein that's found in this phospholipid bilayer, notice this is called a pump. And I'm assuming if you have a pump at your house, like if you have a pump for uh, just simply pumping up your bike tire, well, it's not something that operates for free. Either you have to pump it by hand and add some of your own physical energy, or maybe you have an electronic one that you plug in. Either way, it costs energy to move that air. Same thing, if you want to pump sodium ions or potassium ions with a sodium potassium pump this is not free this costs here's that molecule that's our energy source we're going to use ATP to get that to move so here we have our sodium ions notice they're moving from in this case they're only showing a couple of them on this side they show a lot more on this side we're going to pump them through to areas of lower to higher concentration and the reverse of these potassium ions where we see just a few potassium ions on this side we see more on this side and so we're going to pump the potassium in the opposite direction that is once again in areas of lower to higher potassium concentration so the idea here is you're fighting what those compounds would like to do or those ions excuse me would like to do and moving those ions upstream costing some energy okay then in addition to moving those small things so so far we've been talking about water molecules we've been talking about ions oxygen uh, molecules carbon dioxide that kind of stuff but sometimes cells need to move big materials as in big things or big volumes and so we have some other terminology. So a classic example would be this over here, this kind of a weird looking image. This is an, a photomicrograph. So it's a photograph taken through a microscope. And here is this ghosty looking thing is a white blood cell. And these little things that look like maybe Rice Krispies, those are bacteria. And that round red thing, as you might suspect, is a red blood cell. So what we find is this white blood cell has a job of gobbling up these bacteria. Well, it can't do that using diffusion. It can't use the active transport process. Instead, it can use a process called phagocytosis, right? So this is one of the examples of what's called endocytosis. So if we want to move a large amount of material or a big thing into the cell, we're going to use a process called endocytosis, okay? And down here, I've got some different examples. So here's phagocytosis, penocytosis, and then receptor mediated endocytosis so these are three means by which you can get materials into the cell oh there's a video i'll let you guys play that on your own or excuse me i'll play that in the in the lecture hall so i just was curious what was next so notice what happens here regardless of which of these processes we have a bit of membrane right here this is the cell membrane or the plasma membrane that we addressed earlier it needs to engulf or wrap around these large particles so say this is a bacterium and this is a white blood cell that wants to phagocytize it well it's going to wrap a bit of its membrane around it kind of a little bubble be a good way to think about it and form what's referred to as a vacuole and bring it into the cell to then later destroy it if that's a bacterial cell but that notice that membrane wrapping around this is now in a container called a vacuole so please we want to get to know that name but that process is using membrane to drag a material into the cell same thing penocytosis is typically grabbing larger quantities of like a fluid and same thing, we would find that this is going to be this sort of invagination of the cell membrane forming, in this case, what they're calling a vesicle, a vesicle or a vacuole, almost synonymous, not quite, but that's good enough. To be honest, that here we have a wrapping of membrane and vesicle is a more commonly used name for these bits of membrane bubbles that get, you know, they act as containers. And then here's this receptor-mediated endocytosis, and what they mean by that is here we have a receptor in the cell. And here we have these little stars. What they are exactly is variable, but what we want to catch is they're giving it the name a ligand. And a ligand is something that 
it just a generic term, it binds to a receptor. So here this happens to fit in that receptor site. And if that happens, if this, if this binds to the receptor, well then the receptor triggers the formation of a vesicle. So same idea here, same idea here, but this, this concept is a little bit different than the others in that this is the binding is a triggering process.